All right, welcome everyone to the third conference in the uh, Janet Desarma uh, conference series. Um, this one is Twisted, the Physics of 2D Twisted Moray Systems. Uh, my name is Danny Bullmatch. Um, I'll be the first chair for the day. I'm a po postdoc at University of Maryland, and we have eight wonderful talks lined up for you today. Um, so just so everyone knows, the speakers will ha each have one hour, um, and it is their discretion how to uh, break up that time with between questions and um, or between their talks and questions. Um, we encourage people to ask clarifying questions during the talk, but uh, otherwise to hold any longer questions for uh, question time at the end of the talk. Um, we will be keeping each talk to rough uh, to very close to one hour, uh, just because we have eight hours for eight talks. Um, so with that, let me introduce the first speaker, who is uh, Pablo Carrillo Ferrero of MIT. Um, and he will be telling us today about Moiré Magic 3.0. So go ahead, Pablo. Thank you very much, Danny. And thank you very much, Sankar, for inviting me to this um, very nice conference. I, you know, it's a pleasure to start the conference and it's a pleasure and, and really, I'm very happy to that this is in honor of Janet. You know, we, Janet and I, we, we met a few times, not too many, but a few times. And each and every time was really a pleasure. It was a fantastic occasion, you know, often involving, you know, good food, good wine, and especially good company and friends. So really, I, I have very fond memories of my, of my encounters with Janet, and I am really happy to start this conference in her, you know, to open today this conference in her honor. So I want to tell you about, um, you know, how Moray Quantum Mother has become a new platform for strongly correlated and topological physics, okay? So I think that this is now a platform that is complementary to two other platforms that we have, the actual quantum materials with lattice scales of a few Armstrongs, and since the last past two decades, cold atoms in optical lattices, which in this case, we have a length scale of about a micron, and then more quantum matter with an intermediate length scale of order 10 nanometers, I think forms a very complementary platform to these other two, and that can help us understand you know, the behavior of strongly correlated topological you know, quantum matter. Now, the thing that has possibilitated initially this platform was the fact that we can place two two-dimensional crystals on top of each other at an arbitrary twist angle. This is something which is often called twistronics. Okay, it's a new degree of freedom in condensed matter physics and material science, something that did not exist you know, before 2D materials uh, came to the market, okay? And we can really choose any angle arbitrarily between these two crystalline lattices, okay? So this is non-equilibrium you know, assembly of matter, in particular, 1.1 degrees, why not? As you all know, it's a special angle for magic angle graphene. Now, this happens not only by twisting, by now we know that if you took, take two different materials also, you can form a more pattern and form more quantum matter, okay? So why more quantum matter? I think that, you know, these are just four, you know, uh, four reasons for me, which are interesting, you know, there are many more. It's an easy way to obtain isolated flat bands, okay? And in flat bands, what happens is that you can investigate the interplay between kinetic energy and interactions. And for some of these more quantum matter lattices topology, okay? Now with relatively few simple building blocks, for example, graphene or hexagonal borogram, nitride or transition metal dicalcogenite, you can get a plethora of correlated and topological behaviors, yeah? which brings to, you know, you're almost doing you know, con you know, condensed matter physics without the usual complexity of chemistry in some sense, which brings us to the question of what are the key essential ingredients which are needed for complex emerging behaviors of quantum matter, okay? It's a highly tunable institute platform with electric field, electrostatic doping, strain, pressure, magnetic field, temperature, and tunable also through twist angle or through the choice of more system. So this is one of the most tunable platforms, you know, you know, much more than traditional correlated materials, not quite as extremely tunable as cold atoms, but I think we have a lot, large degree of control. As la and lastly, it's an entirely novel experimental platform to explore vast new families of hybrid materials based on non-equilibrium growth and assembly. Many things which can move beyond these more quantum matters early 
early heterostructures that we are investigating now. So in this more quantum matter, we have observed now many of the phases of condensed matter physics, often with particular twists, you know, with particular, you know, nice uh, uh, sort of differences with respect to other materials and other platforms. I think that it's fair to say that superconductivity is one of those that has attracted most attention. Initially, you know, seen in magic angle twisted bilayer graphene, and then more recently, magic angle trilayer graphene, there are signatures in other systems, and perhaps we'll hear about more in these systems. So a few months ago, uh, both the group of Philip Kim in science and our group in nature, we published in the same week, the discovery of a new, you know, next generation more quantum matter, you know, I call this more magic 3.0, that's the title of my talk. And it was the discovery of, you know, superconductivity in magic angle twisted trilayer graphene, okay? It's a very highly tunable system. And I think it's actually an even more interesting system than the bilayer, it's bilayer counterpart. Yeah? So this is what I wanna be telling you about today. I wanna to tell you about magic angle graphene and more quantum matter. Okay, since I know many people are joining that perhaps are not so familiar with it. And then I'll spend most of the talk on more magic 3.0, magic angle trilayer graphene. I'll show you that it's a robust superconductor. It's highly tunable, realizes super strong coupling superconductivity. I'll tell you about something we saw recently when we apply in plane magnetic fields. Then if I have time, although I don't have to get to this, a little bit of an outlook of some directions which are coming up or, or in other fields. Okay, so graphene is a honeycomb of carbon atoms. You have two, you know, all of the atoms are chemically identical, they're all carbon, but in order to tile a honeycomb, you need a two atom bases in addition to two unit vectors. And these two atom bases, they're called the A and B sublattices or red and green carbon atoms here in this drawing. If you do a simple type binding calculation of electronic structure of electrons in graphene, you have near the Fermi energy, this unusual conical you know, dispersions where energy is linear in momentum. This can be written down as a Dirac equation in two dimensions for massless particles, where instead of the usual spinner, which tells you whether the electron is spin up or spin down, you have now a pseudo spinner, which tells you whether the electron is on the A or on the B type sublattice. Okay. And then in addition to that, you have you know, two of these valleys, which are in equivalence, okay? The K and the K prime valleys. The other are related by reciprocal unit vectors. So we have, Electrons in graphene have these fourfold degeneracy, spin up, spin down, vale k, vale k prime. Just remember number four. So it will appear later. So what happens if you put graphene on top of graphene? You form a moire pattern where the moire wavelength, sort of inverse, the distance between the soccer balls here in the screen is inversely proportional to the twist angle, more or less, for, less twi for small twist angles, okay? That's what happens in real space. What happens in momentum space and therefore to the electronic structure Okay, so these are the Dirac cones from graphene layer one and graphene layer two. Their separation in momentum space is proportional to the twist angle at small angles. This would be a situation if electrons in one sheet did not know about electrons in the other sheet. However, because these are three angstroms apart, the electrons can tunnel between the two sheets. That leads to bonding and debonding states, similar to a hydrogen molecule, bonding and debonding state due to tunneling, but in this case with two graphene sheets, it's like a giant graphene molecule. One of these, you know, the bonding band gets pushed down towards lower energy. This happens when the interlayer tunneling is much smaller than that crossing energy point. But if you decrease the twist angle, you go towards smaller and smaller, you know, bonding band until it reaches zero. And that, you know, then we say that a flat band condition has been reached, and this is reached at the magic angle, which is about 1.1 degrees for graphene on top of graphene, okay? There was a lot of early theoretical work about twisted bilayer graphene. And then about a decade ago, you know, theory work by Bistis and McDonald as well as Morgan collaborators, and also very interesting um, experimental work by the group of Eva and Dre, all related to the single particle physics of this from Hopf singularities and the formation of this flat band. Now, that was a cartoon that I showed you before. If you calculate the actual electronic structure, you know, for magic angle graphene at 1.1 degree versus momentum. So you have these flat bands, okay? Which are separated by gaps from the remote moire mini bands. Now, flat in real space, uh, sorry, flat in momentum space means that when you look at where do the electrons like to go when you place them in these flat bands, okay? You have to do a Fourier transform 
that means highly localized in real space. So if you look at where the electrons like to sit in real space, when you put them in these flat bands, they like to sit in these regions where locally, the two carbon lattices are exactly on top of each other, AA stacking. And then those regions are tunnel coupled by regions of A, B, and B, A stacking where the electrons do not like to sit, okay? Where due to the small twist angle, the two lattices come out of registry and you have this A, B, and B, A type of stacking. So from the top, magical graphene looks like this. You have these A, A regions where the electrons like to sit, separated by A, B, and B, A regions. Now in a slightly more realistic schematic, magical graphene looks like this. This Regions of A stacking are colored in yellow. They are separated by about 13 nanometers. And here is where the electrons like to sit. This is going to form what's or triangle, you know, the equivalent of a triangular Fermi Hubbard lattice. Now I put triangular in quotes because in reality this is a honeycomb lattice. Okay. The A B and the B A regions are not identical. And also, this is not a standard Fermi Hubbard lattice because of the topological properties of magic angle graphene. You do not have a direct mapping to a standard Fermi Hubbard lattice, okay? But this is in spirit a little bit, that's the direction, you know, that's how this looks. Okay, so what we found out back in 2018 is that if you place your chemical potential in these flat bands, you see a series of correlated insulator states, okay? And at, at fractional, you know, fillings of your more you know, uh, super lattice. And when you dope away from electrostatically, electrostatically dope away from the correlated insulators, you have superconductivity. Okay, this is something that happens in a relatively narrow angular distribution around 1.1 degrees. Right? So now we posted, you know, we we published the paper it was officially published in April 2010. So what has happened experimentally since then? So the first thing that happened is that we reproduced our own results many, many times, okay? So in fact, now we're starting to extract, you know, TC at optimal doping as a function of twist angle. You know, these data are from this paper, but there are many more data from other groups right now. So actually that's that's the second thing that happened that many groups, you know, even better than you reproducing your own results is when other groups reproduce them. So many groups have independently reproduced our results and even extended them to very interesting systems. The first experiment to reproduce our results was a collaboration by between Corey Dean at Columbia and Andrea Young at UCSB. Both are speaking at this conference. And they did a beautiful experiment where not only they reproduce our results, but they were able to tune the magic angle condition with pressure, okay? And then look at the superconductivity and really see that it's associated with these flat bands. This was a very nice experiment. The second experiment that reproduced our results and extended them by seeing no, a series of other superconducting domes was by Dima Efetov and collaborators at ICFO. By now, robust superconductivity has been reproduced and extended by many, many groups in magic angle graphene, okay? <clears throat> now, we have discovered other correlated systems. For example, second based on this twisted platform was magic angle twisted bilayer bilayer graphene, where you have now Bernard stack bilayer graphene Bernard stack bilayer graphene, so zero degrees, zero degrees, but not stacking, and then pairwise twisted by the magic angle. Okay, that system is not clear if it's superconducting. If it is, it's a fragile superconductor. If it is at all, but it has interesting magnetic correlated insulator states. Okay? There have been many other systems, and it, again, by now we have systems which are not twisted. You know, more systems without twist, like ABC trilayer, like TMD heterostructures. Those all exhibit interesting correlated physics too. The other thing is that people have started to look microscopically with scanning probe, you know, microscopy techniques, you know, starting with STM and then scanning nanosquids, scanning SET, scanning near field optical microscopy. People are looking in detail at the microscopic structure of these more uh, heterostructures. And it's really very interesting. Let me mention that, you know, there's something about this scanning technique that helped us understand the phase diagram. So initially the information that we had about magic and graphene came from global electronic transport measurements from high group and others. So the phase diagram that, that you know, developed was the following. This is again, a schematic, can depend on twist angle, it's evolving fast, okay? Don't pay attention to the details, just sort of to the overall picture. In a phase diagram of temperature versus filling factor, nu, 
Well, filling factor here means the number of electrons or holes per moiré unit cell. Turns out in these flat bands, from bottom to top, you can put up to eight electrons per moiré unit cell. So from charge neutrality, okay, to the top, you can put up to you know one, two, three, up to four electrons per moiré unit cell. Then you reach this band insulator state, yeah. And then when you go from charge neutrality down, you can go one, two, three, four holes per moiré unit cell. Then you reach another band insulator state here. That's four holes per moiré unit cell. Every time you put, you know, every time you uh, uh, reach an integer, something interesting typically happens. Okay. You can find correlated insulator states. This happened most frequently for two and three electrons per moiré unit cell, also minus two, sometimes for minus three. At one, you find correlated semi metal state. Minus one, most often you don't see anything. Sometimes you see a correlated semi metal state. This can depend on magnetic field and temperature. The charge neutrality, you typically have a Dirac semi metal or Dirac insulator state, depending on, on the on details. Okay, so this information came from global electronic transport measurements. And then we started to gain more insight into what's going on at each of these integers when we started to do thermodynamic measurement. Okay, so in particular, I want to highlight this paper with you know, my collaborator, Shahali Lani at the Weizmann Institute, and similar you know, uh, results were obtained independently by the group of Ali Yazdani. Later on, we refined a little bit these measurements. So what we, you know, in this experiment, you know, the group of Shahal has developed this technique where you can take a, you know, essentially an atomic force microscope, essentially like tip, where you can place a single electron transistor in the form of a carbon nanotube on, uh, at the edge of the tip. And then you can scan, this is a very sensitive electric field meter. So you can scan it on the surface of your magic angle graphene device, okay? And then you can look in space, you can measure the chemical potential of the system, and in particular, the inverse compressibility, okay? And yeah, the chemical potential is mu, d and d mu is called the compressibility, which in single particle physics is equal to the density of states. d mu dn, which is what we typically measure in the experiments, is the inverse compressibility, so you can think of it as the inverse density of states, okay? So then, if you measure you know, the inverse density of states, I'm sorry, the inverse compressibility as a function of filling factor, what you can see is that you have these sharp features near four electrons and four holes per moiré unit cell. And then at each integer in between, you have this sort of behavior. Okay? Let me zoom in here. Sort of behavior, most pronounced for holes, for electrons, okay? So to the zeroth order, there are more complex, you know, uh, interpretations of this now and understanding of this, and we will hear probably about this from Oscar later, but to see the thought that what is happening at each of these integers is that a phase transition is happening. Okay, so we call this a cascade of phase transitions where your system is flavor polarizing, okay, at, you know, near each of those integers. So one way of thinking about this, again, it's a simplistic way, but I think it can be useful, is if you look at the four you know, flavors in the system, spin up, spin down, valley K, valley K prime, Okay, and you look at how are we feeling those flavors as we add charge to our system. Okay, initially from charge neutrality, you start adding charge to all these four flavors at the same time. Yeah, now when you're close to an integer, okay, for example, close to nu equals one, close to one electron per moiré unit cell in total, so close to one quarter of an electron per flavor, the system decides to spontaneously flavor polarize, sends all of the electrons to one flavor empties the other three flavors, okay? And then you start filling again these three flavors. When you're near nu equals two, the system again decides to send the carriers to two flavors, okay? Empties the other two, and then you start again, like that, okay? In a simple model, you know, with this, you can account, you know, for sort of this sort of like behavior at each integer, okay? And again, there are more complex interpretations nowadays, but it's essentially a cascade of phase transitions that takes place at the integers, which have to do with flavor polarizations, okay, of your you know, many body ground state. So this will play a role in what I will tell you later. So the other thing that happened, you know, and very important is the observation of ferromagnetism, anomalous Hall effect, and even the quantum anomalous Hall effect in the systems, okay, which brings topology front and center, you know, to the investigation of these more quantum matter. In fact, one of the nice things about this area, you know, this field is that 
it has meant the merging of several modern condensed matter physics communities. Okay, the two different vast materials community, strongly correlated materials community, and topological condensed matter physics community, all of these come together in this modern quantum matter. And for me, it's really great, you know, pleasure to, to interact with these communities I sometimes didn't speak to so often before and learn, learn from all of them. Okay, so let me tell you now about Modern Magic 3.0. So the system I want to talk about is mirror symmetric magic angle twisted trilayer graphene. That, no, that's, that's quite a mouthful. So let me tell you in a bit more detail. This is the structure, okay? It was a structure proposed by the Bismanath group by Islam Khala. And it's three layers of graphene. From the bottom, you know, we have one layer of graphene. We put the second layer and it's rotated by an angle minus theta. And then we have another layer on top, which is rotated back by an angle theta, which means the bottom and the top layers are exactly aligned on top of each other, okay? This is a configuration called A twisted A stacking. This, you know, a lot more work has been done on, on the system, you know, related work on twisted trilayer multilayer systems. Actually, there are by now quite a few, you know, a few dozen papers about this system. Now, the system has a very interesting electronic structure. Okay, if you think about these three layers with, you know, interlayer tunneling T between each successive pairs of layers. Okay, turns out the Hamiltonian of the system, you can do a rotation, you know, a basic basis transformation, and it becomes block diagonal with two blocks. One block is magic angle twisted by layer graphene like with a square root of two times T effective interlayer tunneling. And another block is just monolayer graphene, okay? So this means that the magic angle for magic angle twisted trilayer graphene, since the flat band condition depends on that interlayer tunneling, as I said earlier in the introduction, because of this square root of two, the magic angle is that of bilayer graphene times square root of two. So 1.1 times square root of two, 1.56 degrees. This means also, that the more wavelength is a little bit shorter because the more the twist angle is larger, the more wavelength is shorter. Okay, nine nanometers instead of thirteen nanometers. Now, in this configuration, where it, you know it's a structurally mirror symmetric, but also electrically, uh, you know, at no displacement field, so all of the graphene sheets are at the same, you know, voltage. The situation for this um, mirror symmetric electronic structure is given here, this is a calculation. And as you can see, we have in orange, the set of magic angle bilayer graphene like flat bands, okay, with the more mini bands at higher energy. And then we have in purple, the massless Dirac fermions from the monolayer block. Okay. Now, in our devices, we have, you know, the magic angle to the trilayer graphene, it's contacted by source and drain electrodes in a whole bar geometry. Then we have bottom and top gates, with this bottom and top gates, we can, if we apply the same voltage, we can change the density to the trilayer graphene. If we apply opposite voltage, we can change independently the transverse electric displacement field, okay? The transverse displacement electric field allows us to break the mirror symmetry of the structure. And then it allows us to hybridize the flat bands and the massless dispersive band, okay? And this degree of hybridization is tunable with your transverse displacement field. Now, let me show you first that this system is a robust superconductor. So you wanna see first zero resistance and indeed resistance goes down to zero. You can fit this with the happiness of formula to extract the TVKT. There is a Theresovsky costly Taurus transition temperature, which is about 2.3 Kelvin, at optimal doping and optimal electric field. TC 50%, you know, which we often quote in this, in, in this 2D heterostructures, it's about 2.9 Kelvin, okay? Let me show you that this has also flat voltage current characteristics with sharp switching. This is a base temperature, you can see it's very flat. It has, the system has very high critical current actually. And then it switches abruptly, okay? You can do this now at finite temperature, extract the VKT temperature from this analysis, which coincides pretty much with this one. Now, the superconductor is also a tunable, electrically tunable superconductor, okay? This is the situation around two holes per motor unit cell, okay? We have, if we add extra holes, we have a large superconducting dome. If we add electrons, we have a tiny superconducting dome. 
We can do the same thing around two electrons per more unit cell. If we add extra electrons, we have a large superconducting down. If we add it cold, we have a tiny superconducting down there. Okay. Now, in a magnetic field, if you are at optimal doping, okay, your differential resistance versus current bias and perpendicular magnetic field, you know, this black means you know critical current. You can see the critical current decreases, but then it has a long tail up to about you know, half a Tesla or so. If you now this is an optimal doping when the superconductivity is very uniform or very strong. If you now go to the edge of the superconducting dome where the system starts to see the disorder, okay, and the system breaks into superconducting and non-superconducting regions, then if you do the same as experiment, you can see this Fraunhofer like you know oscillations of the critical current, which tells you that there is just some phase coherence. Okay. So the system is a robust superconductor. In fact, it's more robust than magic angle twisted by layer graph Okay, right, so let me show you that this is a very highly tunable system. So, because we have these two knobs now, density and electric field, okay, which we can tune independently. Let me show you the phase diagram versus those two knobs. Okay? So this is a resistivity versus filling factor and displacement field, okay? And then this phase diagram is quite complex. Let me guide you a little bit through it. This, Light blue regions are regions of superconductivity, okay? And the yellow regions are regions of high resistance. Okay? Now you can think of this diagram now. And one of the first things you can see is that there is a, quite a bit of symmetry in this diagram, okay? First, there is symmetry between the top half and the bottom half, okay? So this diagram is electric field symmetric, roughly, okay? You can see that superconductivity appears here. It has these branches here. It has these protrusions. They occur at both positive and negative displacement field. Okay. Now you can. You now this tells you that at the very least, the twist angle between the middle and the top layer and the middle and the bottom layer is probably very similar. Okay, as we, as we expected. Now there is also a certain degree of symmetry between. Overall, from charge neutrality, the left hand side and the right hand side. Okay. You can see that superconductivity occurs mostly between filling factors minus two and minus three and between two and three. But there are also these branches, which are sort of symmetric between one and two and minus one and minus two. Okay. Now, the symmetry is not perfect. Okay. There is also asymmetry left to right. For example, most pronouncedly, you can see that many of these highly resistive features are not as prominent or present at all for holes, okay? Now, this is very much consistent or reminiscent of what happens in magic angle twisted by layer graphene. There is also some degree of asymmetry with respect to charge neutrality between overall electrons and holes, okay? Now, because this phase diagram is quite complex, let's see if we can measure another quantity and see if we can find correlations between this quantity and the features that we see in resistivity, in particular with the superconducting features. So the quantity we decided to measure is the normalized hole density, okay, new H. So this is your hole density, which we measured, you know, by looking at the hole voltage at small magnetic fields, and then multiplied by four, the usual four, and divide by the, you know, number of electrons that fit per, you know, or a unit cell. So this is the equivalent of your filling factor new that I mentioned earlier, but for the free carriers that are available to transport, you know, to conduct electricity as determined by your hole density, okay? So if we plot the normalized hole density as a function of filling factor and displacement field, you see again a pretty complex phase diagram. Now to zeros order, okay? Details vary a little bit, but to see that order, most of the features in this diagram can be associated with one of the following three situations, okay? Number one, a gap or a Dirac point, okay? So this happens when you, you know, your normalized hole density as a function of filling factor, you know, crosses smoothly through zero, okay? So you go from dark blue, light blue, white, light red, dark red, okay? That is something that, you know, when you cross a direct point, for example, you don't have you know, your density of 
three careers goes to zero smoothly from negative to zero to positive, okay? And that's something that happens, for example, here when you cross chart neutrality, okay? You go from dark blue to light blue to white to dark, sorry, to light red to dark red, okay? That's crossing a direct point, could also be a gap, okay? Now, second type of behavior is a reset of your normalized hold density. This is the type of behavior that occurs at those you know, phase transitions you know, that I spoke about earlier in the cascade phase transition, okay? You normalize hold density, increases, and then it exhibits a big drop close to zero, and then it increases again, typically without changing sign, okay? So this happens, for example, this can happen in red or in blue. Let me show you a blue example here. You go from light blue to darker blue, then you go to white, okay? It resets to white, and then starts increasing to light blue, darker blue, okay? And then the other thing is behavior of the normalized whole density as a function of feeling factor associated with a Van Hoff singularity, okay? So at a Van Hoff singularity, your whole voltage goes smoothly through zero, which means your whole density, which is proportional to one over the whole voltage, diverges flipping sign, okay? So you see, you can go from starting here in this case from positive new, you can go light blue, darker blue, abruptly switch to dark red, and then lighter red, okay? This is something that happens, for example, here, you see? Light blue, dark blue, abrupt switch to dark red, and then lighter red, okay? Happens also here, it happens at various places. So then we can look at these two diagrams, these two phase diagrams and see if we have any correspondence between the features in one diagram and the features in the other, okay? So let's look schematically at it, okay? Because it's very important those two diagrams would be a bit messy. So this is as a function of displacement field and feeling factor, the superconducting regions boundaries, okay? So here in dark blue, we have robust superconductivity, very strong superconductivity. In light blue, it's weaker superconductivity, but still present, okay? And then if we look at the normalized full density features, in these areas, we have gap dirac type of behavior. In these regions, in orange, you have reset type of behavior. In these regions, in dark blue, we have Van Hoff singularity type of behavior, okay? And as you can see now, in a clear picture starts to emerge. Superconductivity at low displacement field is mostly bounded by resets, okay, of your normalized hole density, whereas at high displacement field, it's bounded by Van Hoff singularities and gap Dirac point, okay, behavior. So let's look in particular at the role of Van Hoff singularities. I'm gonna show you as a function of density here, as a function of filling factor, this yellow trace, various quantities, the resistivity is zero in the superconducting state, then it comes out here, okay? Your critical temperature, of course, starts finite, and then it goes down the moment, you know, gets to zero the moment the system stops being superconducting. Then we can measure the effective mass of power carriers. Now remember, the effective mass is proportional to the density of states in your system. We can see that, you know, starting from here, from the left, you know, from the net, from the normal state, your effective mass is increasing, increasing, increasing. So your density of states increasing, increasing, increasing. It sort of seems to diverge here, has a cusp, and then it decreases, okay? And now you can immediately see, okay, so this cusp where it diverges actually corresponds to that Van Hoff singularity, as you might expect, okay? And then you can see this very interesting behavior, okay? If you come from this side, you might think, oh, my density of states increases, 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 and at some point superconductivity starts. But that's not the correct way of thinking, okay? You should think of it actually from this side. My density of states increases, 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 but my superconductivity is decreasing, decreasing, and decreasing until at the maximum density of states, it reaches zero, okay? What's happening in this purple area is that a phase transition is taking place, similar to that phase transition in the cascade of phase transitions, okay? And the boundary of the superconducting region corresponds to the Van Hoff singularity. It's not the place where superconductivity is strongest, where the critical temperature is maximum, as you would expect 
with BCS type with capital superconductivity is the place where superconductivity ends, okay? So this is very much not consistent with weak coupling BCS type of superconductivity, okay? And I have to say that this is very much consistent with what we had already observed in magic angle twisted by layer graphene. The maximum TC occurs at the maximum inverse compressibility. That means at the minimum density of states, okay? So in, you know, I point you to this extended data figure four in our recent paper on chemical potential measurements using monolayer graphene sensors. Here, you can see that the maximum inverse compressibility, so the minimum density of states is where TC is the maximum in twisted bilayer graphene, okay? So again, the opposite of what you would expect. You expect the density of states to lead to an increase, exponential increase in your TC. In this case, it leads to a decrease, you know, to a minimum or even to a zero, okay? Pablo, can I ask you a question about this? Do you mind? Yes. Yeah, would you prefer, prefer me to wait or can I ask now? Uh, please, go ahead, yes. Yeah, so I just, maybe you'll get there, but I want to understand this a little bit better. So I, I understand, I think, completely what you're saying. The question I want to ask is, if I'm delta on one side of this Van Hoff singularity or delta on the other side, yep. in general, I wouldn't necessarily expect this to be demarking some change in order from one side to the, to the other. You can have a Van Hoff singularity in a band that has a single flavor it's just a curvature of the band that's changing. So why should the Van Hoff singularity mark a transition point specifically in the way that you're describing? Mm -hmm. I'll, I'm gonna address that in, in a few slides, okay? So let me okay. get back okay. to that when okay. I tell you yeah. about where the superconductivity emerged, okay? But we, we do know that this is marking something like that, okay? Okay, thanks. So, all right, let me tell you, you know, that this realizes ultra strong coupling superconductivity. So, we can measure TBKT versus displacement field and feeling factor. Let me project it on this axis. You know, this is quite complex. I'm gonna show you a cut with TBKT versus filling factor at optimal displacement field, and then TBKT versus displacement field at optimal density, okay? Again, the system is very highly tunable. So TBKT versus filling factor at optimal displacement field. You see, this is two electrons per mole in itself. We have a tiny superconducting dome for electrons a much bigger superconducting dome for holes, around two holes per mole itself, okay? Now we can measure in this, along the same trace, the, super, the ginsburg landau superconducting coherence length, which you can see here. And this is a very short superconducting coherence length. Just to give you an idea, this is the average interparticle distance in the system, okay? As a function of filling factor, you can see that the superconducting coherence length is pretty much bounded by the average interparticle distance, certainly near optimal grouping. We can do the same thing as a function of displacement field at optimal density, okay? You can see this, the average in the particle distance. So in the weak coupling limit, the superconducting coherence length is giving you the Cooper pair size, okay? Now, because we're not in the weak coupling limit, it's an, it's an upper bound, okay? So that means that that optimal doping, the Cooper pair size is, you know, smaller or of the same order as the average in the particle distance, okay? Which is again, something very unusual and it, Reminiscent of what happens at the BCS to BC crossover. Okay. So this is taken from Mojito and the Rias review in you know in the uh, you know in, in the cold atoms community, they can vary, you know, using this first back resonance, the coupling strength, you know, in the interacting system. They can go all the way from the BCS limit, where your Cooper pairs are much larger than the average in the particle distance, all the way to the extreme BEC limit, where you have tightly bound molecules much further apart from each other. And you know, the in between is when the Cooper pair size is of the, in the particle distance, that's called the BCS to BC crossover. In 3D, there is an upper bound for it, of TC over TF of 0.22. In 2D, TBKT over TF is bounded by 0.25 and is rich at this, at the BCS BC crossover, okay? So we can measure TF because we measured effective mass and the density of our carriers. We also have TBKT, so we can plot the ratio as a function of filling factor or as a function of displacement field. And this is 0.125. As you can see, TBKT over TF in the system, magic and twisted trilayer graphene, reaches values in excess of 0.1 with a maximum actually about 0.125, okay? Now, typically we measure the strength of superconductors by comparing their critical temperature versus their Fermi temperature, okay? Conventional superconductors tend to be near this corner. The more you go towards this purple band, the more exotic your superconductors are. You know, here are the cuprates the nictites, the heavy fermions, the organics, 
Okay, these are the lines for the 3D and the 2D BCBCS crossovers. Okay, and magic angle twisted bilayer graphene, depending whether you take the 50% almost the persistence of the you know, TBKT to find these two limits. In magic angle twisted trilayer graphene, the experimental data points are here. This is, you know, trilayer graphene is the strongest superconductor, the strongest coupled superconductor that exists in the world. Okay, if the cuprates had the same coupling strength, they would be well above room temperature superconductors. Yeah? I should mention that there is another, a second system, you know, it was a group that showed, I think this paper appeared in Science recently, lithium doped zirconium nitrogen chloride, which also realizes this ultra strong coupling regime. Okay, now, Corey, this comes to answer your question. Where does superconductivity emerge from in the system? Okay, so as you can see at low displacement fields, we have these resets of your, you know, normalized hole density. At large displacement field, you have Van Gogh singularities plus gap Dirac points. Those form the boundaries of your superconducting regions, okay? Now, superconductivity emerges, you know, where, you know, whenever you're populating with charged carriers, a many body ground state, which is flavor polarized and has two open Fermi surfaces, okay? Such as between two and three, minus two and minus three. Now you would say, what happens between one and two at large displacement field? The following thing happens, okay? At, you know, at small displacement fields, if you measure the lambda fan diagrams, all of the fan diagrams point outwards, away from charge neutrality. That's because you're having these resets at each you know, integer, where you start populating flavors with electrons on the right or with holes on the left, okay? And that's what your fan diagrams point outwards, populating those flavor polarized, you know, uh, many body ground states with extra electrons, let's say, for example, on the right here. Now, at large displacement field, what we noticed is that we started to get one diagram that point outwards and inwards and towards charge neutrality away and towards charge neutrality, okay? So now you are populating states with electrons and holes for overall electrons and with electrons and holes for overall holes. And in particular, this region between one and two close to two, it's very interesting because we have a fan diagram which goes towards charge neutrality emerging before nu equals two. What that is telling us is that this Van Gogh singularity, what it's leading, it's leading to a phase transition, the equivalent of a reset, okay, a lower displacement field, but because it occurs before nu equals two, that reset is necessarily taken towards hold open. Okay, that's why you have now a fan diagram, which is whole type. Okay, so you are populating a many body ground state now with carriers with two flavors, but hold up. You go through your gap of direct point and then you start populating it with two electrons. And that's why you have now superconductivity in these two branches. Okay, but in both cases, it has to be, has to do with populating with carriers a flavor polarized state with two open Fermi surfaces, okay? And you either dope them with holes or with electrons, okay? This is essentially the same story. At low displacement field, you have these resets and superconductivity occurs between two and three, between minus two and minus three. At large displacement field, the Van Gogh singularity triggers that phase transition, you know, at an earlier than two, okay? Numerical. Uh, filling factor, and therefore you have superconductivity with holes or with electrons. Uh, Pablo, I, it, this yeah. Pablo, this is Shankar. May I ask you a quick question on this simple sure. model? Uh, the question is that, uh, can you rule out based on this model, a scenario where you have some other phase coming in at the van of singularity, ferromagnetism or something, just suppressing the superconductivity, meaning there is a competing phase because of this flavor symmetry breaking. Can that be ruled out or that's included in your model? Oh, no, no. So, okay. What happens, you know, this Van Gogh singularity separates a region with a single flavor polarized state from a region with two flavor polarized states, okay, with a, with, where, which is flavor polarized two flavors have been polarized, okay? So of course, on this side, on the left side, that single flavor polarized state could be, you know, could be a spin polar phase, a ferromagnetic phase, and more exotic phase, okay? And this is the boundary between those two. So That's you can, the phase. you know- 
So the flavor polarized phase is where your TC is zero now, right? No, the, the okay, TC goes to zero where the von Hoff is. And the von yes. Hoff mm -hmm. separates two phases. One, which has two flavors and where superconductivity occurs. And another one, which has one flavor, the other side of the von Hoff, where there's no superconductivity and where Good. there's only one flavor polarized. Good. And the flavor polarized could be ferromagnetic spin of some kind. Right. Like okay? For example, let me call that ferromagnetic. It could be valley magnetic. That's the phase where you have no superconductivity. Right. Thank you. That's, That's right. what I was asking. Thank you. That's right. Yes. Okay. Let me just tell you in the last couple of minutes, you know, what happens in a magnetic field. If you apply a perpendicular magnetic field, superconductivity gets killed, you know, vortices, usual orbital effect, et cetera. Because these are two dimensional systems, you can also apply an in plane magnetic field because it's, you need hundreds of Tesla to thread one flux quantum per lateral motor unit cell. You don't have the usual you know, you know, vortices to the side. And therefore, you can look at more of what happens with the Zeeman field. Okay. Now, let me remind you that you know, conventional superconductors have spin signet Cooper pairs. The binding energy in BCS is the gap. Okay. Now, the Zeeman field splits, breaks apart these Cooper pairs, okay? Such that the Zeeman energy, the Zeeman splitting is, you know, similar to the gap, then superconductivity should be gone. That's known as the Pauli limit, paramagnetic limit or Chandrasekhar closed on limit. It's 1.86 Tesla per Kelvin times TC. So 1.86 Tesla for a TC of one Kelvin, okay? That's again for BCS spin singlet superconductors. Now, we, Take our sample out of the crest that we warm up, rotate it so that we can apply a large in-plane magnetic field. We cool down again. We measure at zero parallel magnetic field. Phase diagram is very similar to what you saw before. Particular TC here, it's 2.7 Kelvin for TC at 50%, okay? Which you know, should lead to a Pauli limit of about five Tesla. We measure at 10 Tesla parallel magnetic field, and we see that superconductivity is still very much present in an extended region of density in electric field, okay? Now, in order to look at how much we're violating the power limit, we have to do temperature dependence measurements. So this is, again, I'm gonna show you different cuts in a five dimensional uh, space, okay? So this is resistivity as a function of filling factor and temperature at optimal displacement field. This is the usual superconducting dome in temperature, okay? And then we can measure this at different parallel magnetic fields, two, four, six, a 10 Tesla, you can see that even at 10 Tesla, there's still a finite superconducting dome. In order to look at this in more detail, we choose a particular density, okay? Killing factor, in this case, minus 2.28. And now we measure continuously as a value of temperature and parallel magnetic field, okay? Dark blue here means below TVKT, essentially, okay? Now, you can take any threshold that you want for your normal state resistance, 10%, 20%, 30%. You can do TVKT, you can do 50%. The results are all the same. You see that those contours follow a Ginsburg Landau expression where TC is parabolic in B parallel. Okay. You can extract, therefore, what is the Pauli limit for any of these thresholds correspondingly. And as you can see, our superconductivity survives up to much, much, much higher magnetic fields. In fact, the Pauli violation ratio at this filling factor is in excess of three. Okay. Now, there are several mechanisms why you know, power limit can be violated. Most typically, you know, you, in, in BCS superconductors with very strong spin orbit coupling, such as monolayer ion selenide, you can have a large violation of the power limit. This is again, because of this very strong icing type superconductivity due to a huge, you know, strong orbit coupling and, and spin orbit field. However, graphene has a very small spin orbit coupling, okay? It's been measured in bilayer and monolayer graphene to be 40 microvolts, unless for some reason, which we haven't figured out, the spin orbit coupling is enhanced by an, you know, almost orders of magnitude, okay? We don't think this can account for our results. You could also have finite momentum pairing, FFL low states that can give, lead at low temperatures to you know, very low temperatures up to a 20, 30% increase in your critical field. However, you know, in our case, we see a 300%, not a 30%. And it happens right away already from starting from TC not just at low temperatures, okay? So again, we think it's unlikely that FFL of physics explains our results. And then 
preformed pairs, which can lead to pseudo gap physics. There, you know, your 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 gap is related to your amplitude pairing, whereas your TC is related to your superfluid, you know, to your phase stiffness. There's a decoupling of those two, and then you can have large violation, you know, to Pauli limit. Since we realize the strong coupling limit in our system, maybe this is an explanation for our data. However, we can tune with filling factor and displacement field the coupling strength. We can make it over an order of magnitude smaller, and we still see that the poly violation ratio is above two, you know, above two point five mostly. So we think that this is unlikely to explain our data. Okay. Moreover, none of those three mechanisms can explain what I'm going to show you now, which is the fact that I've been showing you data at optimal doping and optimal displacement field, but if we look now at less than optimal displacement field, what we see as a function of in-plane magnetic field is that superconductivity gets killed. This is just focusing on the high field region. Superconductivity, you know, TBKT, suppress, 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 goes to zero, and then reappears. So we have re-entrant superconductivity at large in-plane magnetic field, okay? You can see this in the, you know, TBKT, you can also see it in your critical current, okay? This is something which is extremely unusual and it doesn't happen, you know, via the other mechanisms that I mentioned about before, okay? In fact, this is something that typically only happens in radio literally radioactive compound, the uranium family of compounds, okay? Uranium germanium, uranium rhodium germanium, uranium cobalt germanium, and more recently, uranium T2. These are compounds which are famous because they have, you know, Ferro, there are ferromagnetic superconductors or nearly ferromagnetic spin triplet superconductors, okay? Where you can tune your, you know, your high field, you know, reentrant phase, you know, in this case, for example, by apply, you know, by looking at the different angles. In our case, we can tune this reentrant phase by displacement field and by density, okay? And all of this put together tells us that magic angle to central light graphene is very likely not spin singlet superconductor. It could be triplet, it could be a combination of spin triplet and singlet, you know, called spin valley locked superconductor. Okay, so this is a summary and outlook. You know, magic angle twisted trilayer graphene is the first robust moire superconductor beyond the bilayer. It has exceptional tunability. It's a non-trivial interplay with form of singularities. It relies to a strong coupling regime. There, has, there is large power limit violation and render superconductivity, which means it's very likely not spin singlet superconductor. In terms of outlook, you know, we have, you know, this paper gave us a recipe to make, uh, you know, more and more layers. So I hope, you know, either my friendly competitors or, or ourselves, we will be reporting, you know, at some point, more magic 4.0, 5.0, why not? The role of C2T symmetry, you know, is it essential or not? That has been suggested, remains to be experimentally investigated. What is the spatial symmetry of the order parameter? Can we realize novel correlated topological phases in these systems? So as a zero or low field fraction of chain insulators, something very sought after, you know, plenty of things that we want to investigate, okay? And with this, I was gonna tell you a couple of words about Otto, but I prefer to take questions. So let me go to the most important slide, which is the acknowledgements. This is work done by, you know, my grad student, Jun Sao, Jane Park, and Daniel Rodan for what I've been showing you today, with plenty of other collaborators, both in my group, and elsewhere at MIT and at plenty other institutions. And I hope we all can get back together to this type of events. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Pablo, for an excellent talk. Uh, so now we have about five-ish minutes for questions. If people want to go ahead and jump in. I'm gonna ask another question quick if I can, Pablo. So uh, I think sure. you're clarifying the answer to the question I asked earlier. Um, so the two flavors that exist in the region where you have superconductivity, are you mm -hmm. able to, in, with some confidence, identify what those flavors are? Are you assuming they're spin or are they valley or are they some pseudo spin or what is it, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, so we're not sure about that, okay? Initially, as, as you know, in magic angle bilayer, Okay, the correlated insulated state get suppressed with either parallel or out of plane magnetic field at around six to eight Tesla, something like that. That has been seen by several groups, you know, including yours. So that led us to initially think that the correlated insulated state is probably spin unpolarized. Okay, maybe single, something like that. It's spin unpolarized. So by you know, if if you if you think of you know, we we know that then you dope that state 
and then you have superconductivity. So initially we thought that maybe that means this is spin single type of superconductor. But then magnetization measurements done by Shahal and us using the inverse compressibility measurements, and then separately in our own you know, inverse compressibility measurements with a monolithic sensor, we saw that actually the system, you know, after nu equals two, actually reacts to implant magnetic field by giving you a very high magnetization, okay? So the system might be spin polarized or become spin polarized upon applying a small parallel magnetic field, okay? Now, we haven't done those type of inverse compressibility measurements in the tri-layer case yet, but if you take into account the large power violation limit and so on, it's very suggestive that there may be, you know, either, you know, spin polarization or spin body locking, but you know, very unlikely spin singlet, okay, uh, type of physics in that superconducting state. Okay? But we need to do more experiments to fully confirm this, but that's what I suspect. Okay, thank you, yeah. Uh, can I ask a question? Sure, I can. Uh, the is there any systematic dependence of the Pauli violation ratio on the displacement field, vertical displacement field? Um. Yeah. Yes, we have the data in the paper that will appear soon. It wasn't in the original archive version, but the referees asked us for it. We had it, so we just put it uh, in the paper. I should have had a backup slide with that. It was an, it's an interesting question. I don't have it with me. Initially, so the Pauli violation ratio is high. It's, you know, it starts with a, a the, there is a, a local minimum, but at a pretty high level at zero displacement field. Then it increases a little bit, okay? And mm -hmm. then at the very end of the dome, it, in displacement field, it decreases, okay? So there is a little bit of a camel back you know, if you want with respect to zero displacement field, uh, the data in the paper, I'm happy to send you the, the updated supplementary if, if you would like. Um, but yes, there is some, but not, it's not dramatic, okay? Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? So Pablo, let me ask you a question on how would one uh, go about figuring out what kind of triplet superconductivity it is. I mean, let's accept it's triplet because you apply a parallel magnetic field and the superconductivity doesn't go away. And let's even accept that it's a regular spin based triplet, okay? because of magnetic field. So how do you go about, is it possible to do those various Josephson type measurement to see whether it's B wave or F wave or what? So I think it's, I think it might be possible, you know, and there, you know, the, in this paper that I mentioned here, Christos Zadal, they have all the classification of all the possible order parameters for this uh, system, okay? For singlets, for triplets, for more complex, uh, you know, superpositions of triplets and singlets and so on. And some of them are gapless, some of them are gapful, and you know, um, you know, so you can have nodes, not have nodes, some of them are topological, some are not. So the, the easiest, you know, in quotes, yeah, it's not easy, but the easiest thing to do first, we, for example, by doing tunnel experiments to try to determine if it's a nodal type of superconductor or not, okay? Uh, the same goes, by the way, for bilayer. Okay, uh, people are still trying to investigate what's the symmetrical parameter. Then, once you have that information, you can try to do indeed um, just as an experiment. You know, either in a squid geometry or another type of geometries. You know, by you know this system with itself by different gated regions or by you know doing the tunneling between a Joseph, you know, S wave, you know, a superconductor. We understand well, you know, S wave with this system and then trying to determine, you know, what type of symmetry. Those experiments are doable, are not easy, but they are doable. You know, we're planning some of them. I'm sure my friendly competitors are planning some of them too. Okay, thank you. All right, well, thank you. Uh, thank you again, Pablo, for an excellent talk. Uh, and that concludes thank the time we have. All right.